<clears throat> okay. Um, so welcome once more everyone for um, uh, to uh, it um, lecture in the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series. Um, as you know, the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series is organized by the World Philosophies team at SOAS University of London. And um, we, we started um, running this uh, January last year. Uh, some of you have been part of the journey and we've um, enjoyed quite a number of interesting um, lectures and conversations around what philosophies are and um, uh, epistemic injustice, um, epistemic colonization, um, personhood, and so on. Um, but this year, we've, we've started focusing on um, lectures or discourses on specific philosophical traditions. So um, for some of you who were here in February, we, we looked a bit at Mexican philosophy. We had uh, Professor Sanchez talk about uh, existentialism. And today we'll be um, uh, looking at a, a very interesting and important aspect of Chinese philosophy. Uh, so you're all welcome to this lecture. And um, I thank um, Dr. Andrew Heinz, who is one of the core teaching members of um, the World Philosophies Program uh, for joining as well. Um, we have um, uh, other core members who can't make it uh, at the moment, Dr. Sean Hawthorne, who is the uh, head for World Philosophies, and uh, Dr. Bion Freta, who I'm not sure if he's here now yet, but might be able to join us later. Um, so today we have the pleasure and the honor to um, uh, hear the lecture uh, delivered by Professor Ronnie Littujan. Uh, Ronnie Littujan is uh, the Cheney Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Director of Asian Studies at uh, Belmont University. Uh, Littujan uh, is widely published in Chinese philosophical tradition. His works include the very recent and fascinating book, which I use uh, for some of my modules, Chinese Philosophy and Philosophers, published by Bloomsbury in this year, 2022. Um, other of his works include Introduction to Confucianism, um, published by the Foreign Language Teaching and Research Press in China uh, in 2020, uh, the, History, the, the Historical Dictionary of Taoism, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2019, uh, Taoism and Introduction, published in 2009. Um, and he's also co-editor of Riding the Wind with Lazy, um, New Perspectives on the Taoist Classic, uh, published by Sony Press in 2011. He's uh, a recipient of the Foreign Scholar Award for the, from the Henan Province Ministry of Education. And he was one of the only three foreign scholars asked to speak at the dedication of the Laozi and Taoist Culture Center in Louis County in 2009. So we have uh, before us someone who is uh, an expert in the field and um, who is widely published in um, Chinese philosophy. And so it's really a privilege and an honor to introduce him and to uh, listen to his uh, lecture today. So we'll have him speak for maybe 40, 45 minutes thereabout, and then we'll have enough time for questions and comments. Uh, as I said earlier, feel free to drop your um, comment or question on the chat as the uh, lecture goes on, and we'll attend to it after the lecture. Uh, so, um, uh, Professor Littujan, you have our attention. Thank you so much, Elvis, and let me express my appreciation to you and to Andrew, to everyone at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. It's a great honor for me to be here today. And we have many experts in Chinese philosophy who are here. Um, uh, I see so many names appearing from whom I have learned a great deal. Uh, nice to see uh, PJ Ivanhoe here and David Chai and my good friend Karen Lai from whom I've learned a lot. And so many of you, I could, I could uh, take a few minutes and uh, 
and, and name every one of you. And uh, it would take me all of my time and then some to comment on the things that I've learned from you. So I hope that um, we will have some stimulating uh, conversation and I'm sure we will not all agree, but we will all learn from each other. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of your attendance today. Thank you uh, so very much. Uh, so I'm going to share screen. And uh, as Elvis has suggested, I've prepared a PowerPoint to walk through. Uh, so a few of the slides may seem to you to uh, be a little busy with text, and I apologize in advance on that, but I will, I'll try not to read to you, but I, I did want to um, um, follow the directions of Elvis rather than just read a paper, so give me a second. So our topic today is contemplative transformation in early Taoism. We're going to be talking about figures uh, who could be called uh, perfected persons uh, with the Chinese genren or um, superlative persons with the concept uh, jiren throughout our conversation today. And so I laid out a, a kind of plan for us um, and just to keep myself organized and, and hopefully to let you know where we're going and how we're moving through things. I'm going to, first of all, mention just a few individuals. We'll look at a few texts. And um, I think without exception, all of these are taken from Zhuangzi because the corpus of uh, Taoist lore and text on perfected persons is very extensive. Uh, it would even include, for example, uh, Go Hong's uh, fabulous work, uh, as well on, um, on immortals or transcendence, uh, as our friend uh, Rob Capney calls them. Um, so I'm just going to um, refresh our mind on who these people are we're talking about, who have been changed by contemplative practice. Then secondly, I just want to look at the actual regimen uh, used and we will reconstruct that from various texts. And also we'll look at uh, the very famous and seminal essay, uh, uh, Zuo Wang, uh, setting and forgetting or setting in oblivion as uh, Livia Khan translates it. And then lastly, and maybe our main focus will be uh, on just what it is uh, that I think happens in the practice of Taoist con contemplation. And here I'll enter into conversation um, probably most directly uh, with uh, Hal Roth, with Harold Roth and his essay on bimodial uh, consciousness. So that's uh, more or less the plan that uh, I've set out for us. And uh, again, by Elvis's suggestion, we'll uh, maybe go through and save our questions uh, till the end. And so please uh, jot down questions or comments uh, that, that you'd like to make. We, uh, uh, I know I am very interested in hearing your comments as well. So who were these, um, who were these persons? Um, in the Tao Te Ching, there's just uh, one snapshot of these individuals uh, where they are char characterized in uh, pretty much, I would say, poetic sorts of descriptions. But I think by just looking at this, you can see uh, how remarkable the individuals were regarded and how distinctive they were regarded. And um, whoever uh, was a transmitter of this particular uh, Logion into the Tao Te Ching, uh, makes use of all sorts of Taoist imagery. For example, that these individuals are receptive as a valley. This is an image that shows up a great deal in the Tao Te Ching. Uh, in, um, in 
P.J. Ivanhoe's translation, he also makes a, uh, a, a very significant point about the role of the valley and the role of the feminine, uh, which is uh, receptivity, shapeable as a block of wood. And of course, uh, those of us who are students of Taoism know that here they're talking about not a manufactured block of wood, but an uncarved block of wood that then becomes shapeable by their contemplative practice. This is one snapshot, and you can take a minute to uh, uh, read this through. It's probably one of the most famous passages uh, in Zhuangzi talking about uh, the perfected persons here called spirit persons or spirit men, Shen Ren, uh, who abide in the uh, mountains of uh, Gushur. Now, so uh, actually, we will see along the way that contemplative practice in Taoism up till maybe the second century of the Common Era was very often related to caves and uh, mountain dwellings. And uh, Thomas Michael, myself, and others have pointed out uh, many times the significance of caves in um, in Dallas in early Dallas practice, especially uh, in the cultivation of contemplation. And if we have time, I'll try to comment along the way on why I think that this fact is quite significant, uh, not just in China, but uh, across India, especially Northern India and into uh, Europe, into the Mediterranean area. And we would find the pre-Socratics engaging in contemplative practice uh, in cave dwellings as well. Uh, partly because caves uh, played such a, a significant physical or spatial role in being able to follow the regimen to enter the contemplative states. There are many, as you know, created dialogues, invented dialogues in the Zhuangzi where Confucius is the main actor and is often made to speak as a Taoist. And this is one of those uh, from the sixth chapter. And here he is responding to a question from Zikong, one of his uh, most prominent uh, disciples in which uh, he is trying to describe these individuals, the Jen Ren, and why, how they look so different. And permit me, maybe I will read a little bit of this. Such men as they said, Confucius, wander beyond the realm. Men like me wander within it. Beyond and within can never meet. It was stupid of me to send you to offer condolences. Even now they have joined with the creator and wander as men in the single breath of heaven and earth. Idly they roam beyond the dust and dirt. They wander free and easy in the service of way. So again, just uh, getting our, our feel for how these individuals might have appeared in a normal community or ordinary community. Uh, if you've been teaching Taoism, you know that one question that you often get from uh, contemporary students is, well, how could you be a Taoist and still exist in a contemporary community? And I think that's a real qu question and one that should be uh, taken with seriousness. The practices that eventuated in perfected persons were transmitted along lineages. Uh, the Zhuangzi has several uh, narratives in which it makes clear uh, that there are uh, long lineage student and disciple, uh, pardon me, disciple and master lineages, uh, which carry along uh, not just teachings, but carry along instructions and practice. Uh, this is just one of them, but I think uh, it's probably the most detailed in, in some sort of intent to respond to 
uh, a question about where, where one gains the knowledge of, of contemplative practice uh, in, in this particular response is given, of course, by a very famous female Taoist master. And the last one of these here maybe toward the end here, ordinary men strain and struggle against life. The sage appears to them to be ignorant and blockish, but he takes part in 10,000 ages and achieves simplicity and oneness. For him, all the 10,000 things are just what they are, and thus they unfold each other. So that's a little survey, a very brief survey of what uh, kinds of individuals I wanna talk about. And I want to point to some of the central features of the Taoist practices that eventuated in these individuals uh, acting and living as they did. Even though I've called attention right now uh, to the Zhuangzi primarily, and maybe one passage from the Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, uh, you can see that we could trace uh, records of and allusions to the practices that eventuated in perfected persons uh, throughout many texts. And these texts span a, a large period of time. Um, the Huananza, uh, for example, uh, would be about second century BCE. The Taiping Jing would be maybe first to second century of the common era. Uh, then we have the, um, uh, the Shanger commentary on the Lao Tzu in which uh, the practices of um, particularly of stillness, quietude are uh, very important. We even have instructions from the community that produced that, that particular commentary, instructions on how to create a uh, quiet room. Uh, by the time th that commentary was written, uh, the, let's say second century of the common era, uh, by, that, by that time, uh, it was not convenient. Uh, if you were trying to follow uh, the Taoist way or the Taoist practice, trying to cul cultivate and oneself by contemplation. It wasn't convenient to go to the mountains and live in the caves. So uh, it was necessary for the various new communities of Taoists to um, create instead um, quiet rooms and every house, every Taoist family was supposed to have one. Uh, we find the same sort of instructions, uh, set of uh, formulas for contemplative practice in the Baoputza uh, and in the text, all the way down to Wang Changyang's uh, instructions on transformation, which would take us into the 12th century. So you can see a long history. And uh, you'll notice on the right that um, uh, the newly published work that came out in 2022 of Harold Roth, which is a, actually a collection of earlier essays uh, written by um, Professor Roth, uh, in which he will um, detail not only the sort of regimen of contemplated practices, but we will reconstruct them from uh, all of these texts, actually. So this is what uh, the reconstruction will look like. We find in these texts a recurring family of concepts, each concept pointing to a particular kind of practice, uh, the practice of stillness, <clears throat> the, the practice of silence or quietude, uh, the practice of uh, making the mind uh, empty, void, uh, 
uh, also associated with what's called fasting the mind. Um, the practice of opening oneself in receptivity, borrowing particularly the, the matter, metaphor of the feminine, the feminine being receptive, be, not only because it is yin rather than yang, but uh, because, for example, in sexuality, the feminine is receptive. And then, of course, the general term that is used sort of as a classification for the entire contemplative practice, the notion of uh, so one setting in forgetfulness. So um, you can see then why caves were uh, so closely associated with contemplative practice in early Taoism, especially the earliest um, forms of Taoism that we find ensconced in uh, the Lao Tzu, in Zhuangzi, in the Guanzi, and also uh, even in the Huananzi. Uh, because, a, you know, a cave is, a, is an area separated from the external. It's, um, it's filled with stillness, silence, quiet, quietude, the further you go in it, the, the more void it uh, becomes. So it is actually a space that uh, makes possible uh, the, the suspension of uh, a sense of body and a sense of sense perception, which belong to the notion of shu or emptiness. One is not just emptying oneself of um, discriminations like success and failure or, or, or virtue concepts like courage or honesty that, that uh, or benevolence or appropriateness as the Confucians would have it. It's uh, one's not just emptying oneself of um, concepts of, of the mind uh, linguistically instantiated or rationally instantiated, but also of of sense perception itself, of awareness of body. And uh, of course, many studies have been done uh, about just how radically space, time and so forth are affected uh, by being in uh, a cave. And, and I'm sure almost everyone's uh, walked through a cave on some tour group when they've turned off the lights, uh, but that's just a momentary blink of the eye. Um, it takes about 15 minutes uh, for a sense of uh, disorientation uh, to occur. And, and I'm suggesting that this was certainly a part of contemplative practice um, as it was known in early Taoism. The essay on setting in forgetfulness was uh, written during the Tang period, and it's definitely um, the most important essay in terms of gathering together. Sima Chengjian, who wrote the essay, uh, collected material from the text that, we, that I've been talking about and that we've already sort of uh, hinted at and pointed to. He watched carefully the recurrence of the concepts that I've tried to identify. And then he brought them together into uh, basically a pattern of practice, which could be transmitted along uh, master disciple lineages. And um, he's got seven steps here. And uh, these you can see. And I hope maybe you'll have some questions about those a bit later on. Olivia Kahn has done um, a fine translation of that book into English. So just looking quickly at um, the components of this practice, stillness uh, being one of them, um, there is a there's an idiom in Taoism, in early Taoism, that we see 
specifically in the Dvangta, uh, according to which uh, a, a master is said to be able to make his body or her body, the body, as an old dead tree and appear in such a far off state of mind that the mind is like dead ashes. Now, when you read this, I don't know about you, but this this doesn't necessarily sound that appealing to me, but I think they're trying to um, capture um, what it is for one to look look on someone in uh, a state of contemplative practice for uh, a third party uh, to look at this individual. And all five of those uh, instances or passages from Zhuangzi uh, are recorded by an external observer, uh, maybe looking at Lao Tzu or some other figure and describing uh, their appearance in this way. It's not unlike what we would find uh, in the pre-Socratic, in terms of descriptions of uh, Parmenides, Epimenides, um, practicing what in um, what in Greek is called incubation. Um, and so again, in, in, in that practice, done also in a dark place, a cave, the, the practitioner uh, is completely still and completely quiet. I dare say that the most famous of the exchanges or dialogues between Confucius and anyone else in the Zhuangzi is Confucius's dialogue with Yan Wei, uh, where Yan Wei talks about uh, that he feels he is getting there um, because he can set in forgiveness. Uh, forgetness, uh, forgetfulness, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm trying to drink a cup of coffee and that's uh, got caught my throat. So I think it's interesting to pay attention to Yan Wei's last response to Confucius. Uh, what do you mean set in forgetfulness? I let loose the conscious connection to my limbs and my physical structure falls away. I do away with sense perception and set aside what I thought I knew, and I can become identical with the great thoroughfare. This is what I mean by sitting in forgetfulness. So um, notice that, again, there's a real disconnection between body, sense perception, and uh, what one thinks one knows that go on in this emptying and forgetting. Here, Confucius is doing the instruction. In the previous slide, Confucius was the student, Yan Wei the teacher. In this, in this slide, Yan Wei is back to his traditional role of being a student and Confucius playing the role of teacher. Okay, so uh, I think perhaps we uh, will not stop right now and uh, go further into slides about cave experiences and contemplative practice because I'm anxious to move on to a discussion of what happens what is it that actually happens in the practice of Taoist contemplation? So in Roth's essay, in which he's trying to address this question of what actually goes on in uh, contemplative practice in early Taoism, he titles the essay, bimodal mystical experience uh, in the Qi Wulan, which is the second chapter of Zhuangzi. 
So uh, these terms in his title are very important. Uh, bimodal means two types of consciousness going on. And the fact that uh, Roth definitely uses the concept of the mystical, of mysticism. He doesn't speak of mindfulness. Uh, he's um, speaking in, uh, and relying on work originally done by uh, individuals such as Walter Stray, uh, Stace and um, uh, also even William James on uh, mystical experiences and what, what they are like. And he is saying that in the contemplative, and this is an interpretation, in the contemplative experience of early Taoist, um, they experience something uh, both internal or introverted and something extroverted. Um, and he employs the old, uh, the old analytical distinctions in epistemology between knowing that and knowing how. So that um, Roth uh, argues that in, in this contemplative mystical experience, uh, there is first an entering a state of consciousness in, what, in which one gains knowledge. There is cognitive gain. Um, this gain may not be in language. Um, you know, sometimes when we think of thoughts uh, or what it is we know, we're thinking in terms of uh, a sentence. We're basically talking to ourselves when we're having a thought. And um, uh, Roth is not asserting that this kind of knowledge, mystical knowledge, is uh, something that occurs in language. In, in fact, of course, we know that Taoist texts often speak of the wordless teaching. And uh, Roth makes the connection between the introverted, cognitive, mystical gain uh, that occurs and our normal form of expressing knowledge or, or thinking about knowledge claims or things we know. This is followed by a return to a re-engagement with the world, uh, a kind of ex extroverted consciousness where the mind is re-engaged, the body is re-engaged in its daily uh, routine, but it, it's armed with this mystical knowledge. Um, and here, uh, Roth is using mystical to uh, distinguish it from knowledge that comes by sense or by reflection or by rationality. So if you're talking about uh, sources of knowledge, uh, you know, we would talk about senses and reason, perhaps logic uh, and so forth. But uh, He's multiplying these sources to include the, the mystical state of contemplative uh, practice. And by means of this knowledge, this gain of something one knows, uh, then one has a know-how. Uh, one can act in spontaneous, uh, effortless action, uh, which, for which we can use the Taoist concept of Wu Wei. So do please permit me to read this quote. After the experience of merging with the way, one has discovered the axis at the center of the circle within. And so when one carries this experience back into everyday life and naturally maintains a connection to the way, one can always respond spontaneously and harmoniously to whatever the situation demands, to whatever set of it, other or that's it, that's not categories are found in the limited Weisher viewpoint, that is external viewpoints of the world of those with whom one is interacting. So 
So uh, as Ross says, we might, might best describe the extroverted life that is enabled, empowered, uh, get, uh, instructed by the introverted mystical experience as a Tao-centered mode of being. Where Tao replaces ego or self. Now, I have some difficulties with this interpretation. Um, I think uh, embedded in this argument are some very significant philosophical traps. Um, and one of them is the emphasis that is being placed on mystical knowledge as another kind of knowledge or another type of knowledge which then sort of inserts itself between the practitioner and her movement. Um, some sort of knowledge content uh, has, to be, has to be specified or given. And maybe the Taoist texts do speak of, uh, you know, wordless teaching. But this, to me, as a philosopher, this continues to exacerbate the problem um, of just what knowledge is gained here. And if you think about the very intense and extensive ways in which um, even the, the text Franza criticizes thinking that the solution to the human predicament uh, the human puzzling, the human tying of ourselves in knots, uh, even thinking that knowledge is the solution to this. Um, in chapter two, for example, or uh, parables like the parable of the yellow emperor and his black pearl, these are all meant to criticize the idea that knowledge is a solution um, to the predicament of the human being. Uh, I think there's another problem with the bimodal reading, and it is that it's continuing to preserve what we might identify as a very Western way of thinking about, let's say, morality, where we might think of, uh, of rational morality, we might conceive of the entire moral enterprise as constructions of dilemmas and solutions of dilemmas and figuring out excusing conditions and matters such as this. Um, or uh, we might think of care ethics and sentiment and so forth. And here I'm, I'm thinking of, of Michael Sloat's work on moral sentimentalism. But if it, it, his recent work and so forth. But if you think of Sloat's work here, you have to acknowledge really that he's still conceiving of a sort of rationalist, sentimentalist split. And I think my argument is such a split like this never addresses the problem of the will what it is we know or what it is we feel, we must still think about how to will, how to will it, how to do it, how to move our volition. So I'm, my argument is that what takes place in Taoist contemplation is that the practitioner doesn't come to know something, but a practitioner herself, himself, is actually changed, altered, uh, and altered not by knowledge, uh, some sort of knowledge gain, but altered by the practice in which they're engaging. Uh, this practice which produces a kind of alternative consciousness, which is really another way of talking about transformation. Taoists do say 
that person is remade. Uh, we could pick any number of 30 or 40, I think, examples of uh, the analogs that Dallas Techs make between um, the, the practitioner or the genran, perfected person, and one who has become newborn, uh, who has become like an infant. So the point of Dallas uh, contemplative practice, I think, is uh, not what it leads to in, in terms of it leading to some sort of gain of cognitive knowledge, even, even some sort of quote unquote special knowledge like mystical knowledge, but rather what the experience consists in. And that is the actual transformation of a person. So the practitioner then uh, doesn't rely on something that she knows from a mystical experience, but rather something she's become. So I think that this is what Taoism offers. Taoism, I wouldn't classify really as a soteriological uh, tradition, um, but maybe it's more like a therapeutic tradition, and, but it's a very robust one, uh, one meant to solve and break the hold of, of, of the will. Um, or the tension between knowing and willing, or feeling, having sentiments and willing. Um, and it's meant to break this hold by the transformation of the practitioner himself. Now, this also suggests something maybe even uh, somewhat more controversial, uh, and that is, how the concept of Tao is being used here. Um, oneness with Tao, unity with Tao. Um, I'm suggesting that these expressions are not meant to point to, to a nominative, the Tao. Um, not even an identification with it. Not even a, a, a oneness with some sort of force that moves or inclines us, um, but rather oneness with, with Tao is a way of talking about the new being that has been made possible by contemplative practice. So just as Sema Chen, Cheng Jin would have it in his seventh step, one achieves Tao. So Tao is not something to believe in, have a relationship with. It's not even something to use. It's something to become. And maybe understood in this way, uh, again, we can see a closeness between uh, the, maybe the notion of Jen Ren in early Taoist contemplative practice and the Greeks, Daimon. So Taoists, I think, are pointing to something very significant in uh, their constructions and their practice of contemplation as, as they understand it. And that is an, op an apotheosis of the human being. And this, I think maybe we should take the analogy of uh, new birth rather seriously here. And I conclude with this. Uh, Wang Chong Yong uh, was the uh, founder of uh, the complete perfection uh, lineage of Taoism, Chuan Jin, uh, still the major lineage of Taoism active in China today. Um, he describes his experience of contemplation as. Um, spe he speaks of himself as a now living dead man. 
So there's some sense in which he dies and is you know, reborn in, in this uh, experience. And uh, in his case, the, this experience uh, found expression in his poems, in his poetry. And uh, I hope by now you uh, had a chance to just read through this one poem, because I, I think that uh, it is an attempt to express how he feels himself recreated. So I want to thank you so very much for your attention um, and look forward to your comments and questions uh, along the way. So Elvis, thank you for allowing me that time. Maybe I'm over a few minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Ronnie. Um, that was um, uh, packed with a lot of information um, uh, that cuts across a lot of theoretical issues in philosophy, epistemology, philosophy of mind, consciousness. And, and um, uh, before I could digest a bit, you started another. So <laughs> I'm sure there'll be um, a lot of questions, um, comments. Uh, some may come. Um, perhaps after, after this hour or so, um, to your email or something. Yeah, but, but thank you. Thank you so much for that. I was, I was particularly um, uh, interested in, in the idea that, uh, of how contemplative practice um, is not a route to knowledge, but so, some sort of um, uh, altered being or a changed uh, being to the extent that it it, it leads to um, you know it it sort of um, bridges this bimodality or binaries of knowing and willing sentiments and rationalism and so on and that that's something I would really like to um, you know hear a bit more about perhaps uh, but um, I I would now ask for um, um, anyone who likes to who would want to ask a question or comment, anything. You can put it on the chat. You can raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask. Uh, so let's begin with Andrew, please. Um, thank you so much, Professor Littlejohn. I, I, I learned uh, quite a lot. That was very informative. So um, it was a huge pleasure to listen to. I was really, one of the things I, um, that I think with my first years here at SOAS quite a lot about is the way in which philosophical ideas are shaped by the context within which they're you know, written. Um, and I was really struck by the section when you were talking about the concepts um, you know, uh, of stillness, not just being about <clears throat> stillness in this massively abstract sense, but through the practice. And I wondered if you could say a bit more about that. Like I know myself living in London here, it's massively gray. But when I go to Greece, I'm suddenly like, oh, this is what Plato was talking about with the sun, you know, and, and I wonder how the how the experience of the cave would would shape. Uh, and I mean, the cave in the, your, your research and how the, that experience would shape these concepts. Could you talk a bit more about that? I think in the earliest forms of what we might call Taoist practice, there are no texts, right? So individuals are participating in behaviors uh, and for whatever reason, they're, they're living in, uh, in caves. This is just, um, I think, anthropologically correct because, uh, you know, caves are shelters. Uh, um, they can be secured, this sort of thing. And from my own point of view, they, it, by, by living in these, they began to have certain sorts of, uh, certain sorts of experiences such as I've, uh, I've described. And um, uh, sometimes if, if you do have um, a sense where uh, your sense perception is really radically altered, you do get still. Uh, and um, and then you can replicate the experience by following something that maybe originally wasn't followed by intention. And so then that's how it becomes a practice and that's how it becomes part of a regimen, I think. And these, I think, predate the text. And the text follow as 
various kinds of expressions or attempts to express what, you know, what's experienced. Um, uh, there's a, uh, a quite, a, a book that's been influential on me uh, by uh, Yusinova, um, a, a, a Russian scholar who is called uh, uh, The Caves in the Greek Mind, and where she's primarily addressing um, the role of that form of living on pre-Socratic philosophers such as Pythagoras and Parmenides and Epimenides and um, and, and trying to highlight the fact that we, we might think of, for example, Pythagoras, we may think of a log as a logician and a mathematician, but actually Pythagoras was a priest. And uh, he, oh, and now we know that he, um, he lived underneath his school uh, in a set of caverns and he trained his students there. And the, the form of initiation by incubation was, was a very important entry um, into his school and such. So I think we, we notice, we're noticing a phenomenon that is transcultural uh, dating back to the fifth, fourth, fifth, maybe even sixth centuries um, BCE. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, uh, we have um, uh, Ruth Schumann, did I pronounce that right? And then after which we'll have um, Black Simmons. Thank you, Alphys. Thank you, Ronnie. I think it's very good to pay attention to Taoism and Taoism. Um, what I noticed in your talk is that you're saying um, there would be a perfected being, a perfected person even. Um, so you seem to suggest that the transformation is of an imperfect person to a perfect person. And I think this is um, a typical Western thinking because it, it seems from Taoist text directly that it's a transformation from believing yourself to be a person who has consciousness to realize that you are consciousness and having a human experience. So you, you're not a person having a conscious experience you are consciousness having a human experience. And once you realize that you are consciousness and that the human being is something that appears to you, then this human being, you see that this is part and parcel of what appears, part and parcel of the world. And that person naturally acts, cannot but do what it must do, what it will dictates it to do. So. This is Wei Wu Wei. This is the person does nothing in the sense that it intentionally does anything. This intention is coming from somewhere we don't know where, and this person must do that. So he does nothing, and yet he leaves nothing undone because the things are happening. And I think the, the greatest uh, practice to make this switch from identification with the human being to identification with consciousness are the practices you described, the, the cave as the, the, uh, the sense deprivation room of Anna Letra, um, but especially also the butterfly parable, which is so famous. Uh, this Chang Chu dreaming that he was a butterfly and then waking up and not knowing if he was Chang Chu or if he was a butterfly. And what is the answer? Um, neither, he was neither Chang Chu. He was also not the butterfly. He was the one that was aware of having been a butterfly in the dream and being Chang Chu in the waking life dream, let's say. So this points directly at, at consciousness. And then Chang Chu says, this is the great transformation. Could you see oh, something in that? Thank you so much for your, for your comments. Um, 
I wouldn't drive too heavy a truck over this word um, perfected uh, because the, the Chinese is genren and gen can be just complete or actualized or often is translated as true, true person. Um, so I don't mean perfection in the sense, let's say in the Greek sense or Western sense uh, of perfection, like moral perfection, something like that. And I do quite agree with you, though, I, you know, I didn't get into uh, the question of consciousness itself. I don't think the Dallas uh, texts are suggesting that, but I'm not sure about this, but I don't think they're suggesting that we have a conscious or consciousness, like something. And I think that's your main point. Or one yeah. of your main points was that you know we no we don't we don't have a mind we don't have a consciousness uh, in this sort of thing as an object um, and, at all and so when I'm talking about uh, contemplative practice um, being a way to become another person or for a transformation of the person I mean transformation of consciousness okay uh, here and. Um, but we would, uh, I think you and I would have a great time talking together about uh, Wittgenstein's notion of consciousness and person and um, um, use, of, um, use of personal pronouns, the I and so forth. So thank you so much for your comments though. Thank yeah, you. That was a very interesting uh, um, angle um, to um, discuss from. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Blake? Uh, hello, Dr. Littlejohn. Hi, Blake. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, I'm living the dream. Are you in Shanghai? Uh, for a week. I've got a flight back to Nashville, um, May 6th, so maybe we should get some coffee when I get back. Um, but uh, I found your presentation really relevant to me because I'm currently writing about the notion of goodness in Taoism for my thesis. Um, and I guess this is slightly connected to the previous question from, and I'm so sorry if I butchered your, your name, but uh, Ruud Schurman. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not too familiar with the, or not as familiar as I should be with the Zhuangzi, but in the Tao Te Ching, we hear that the way the Tao takes its model from what is self-so, from what is Zeren. And so I was just wondering if there was a connection between the Junren, like the perfected person, just being what is self-so, or if there's um, maybe those two things don't directly match up. Oh, I, I don't know. I think they do match up. I think the uh, perfected person altered by the practice, contemplative practice I've tried to describe in, in, my new, in, in general terms. Um, this person then who weighs, you know, he acts as uh, Rude suggested in, in Wu Wei, he moves in Wu Wei. And this is a kind of self-sowing, uh, yeah. I think what I would caution us as we think about this, I would, the one caution I would raise is not to think that there is some emulation of the good or uh, even the Tao as the good or following the Tao as the good. Yeah, I, I think uh, those, um, those would be dead ends for us that might take us down um, the road of what Rude is cautioning us about, um, uh, you know, importing Western, uh, Western readings onto the text or onto the Tao and so forth. So I just, I, I'd be cautious about that. Okay, thank you so much. And hopefully see you soon. Definitely.
Elvis, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Blake. Uh, so now we'll have um, Philip and then um, we'll have Helen. Oh, thank you. Um, so Ronnie, as always, it's uh, uh, edifying to, to hear uh, you talk about these things. And I had just it's two- Good to see I, you, my to... friend. Good to see you, my friend. I had two just uh, kind of comments that I, I'd like you to then comment on. One is about the cave metaphor or caves. And then the other is about your claim about knowledge. Uh, and these are just things really kind of uh, suggestions that I'd like to hear you talk more about it because uh, especially on the cave, you talk about it being a good symbol for the quiet and the, that it conveys the ideas of quiet and silenceness. But it also, as you were talking, it made me think it's also a symbol of things like the female, uh, yeah. Yeah. emptiness, um, the inner, uh, that it transcends the everyday in the sense of cuts off our contact with other kinds of uh, the normal sensory world. And then uh, it also made me think, uh, gee, it, it seems like uh, it's almost the antithesis of the use of the cave in Greek thought. So even though they're both using caves, you know, um, I think metaphors don't, often don't carry all of their meaning uh, until they're contextualized. But I mean, for Plato, the whole idea is to get out of the cave, <laughs> right, and get to the light. Right, right. Whereas, you know, so I just thought it's a really, really interesting observation about, and I never really thought of caves in terms of their philosophical symbolism and meaning, but I, so that, that's just my first comment, and I, I, I invite you to say something. The other thing's really short, and that is, I think you're absolutely right about knowledge. Um, the, the role of, you know, the idea that somehow a special knowledge is sought for. I think if you go down that route, you end up in the problem that Professor Sherman was talking about and uh, that, that if you're conscious of something, then you're still in a duality with something and separated from the world and you can't get into Wu Wei and all these things. And I was thinking a good, you know, an example of it for me is, is are things like, you know, say you're agoraphobic. Right. And um, that's a not natural state to be not want to get outside. Right. So you want to get back to, again, a con kind of Taoist, back to return to a normal, healthy, spontaneous state. Well, you don't sit there and study psychology in order to overcome agoraphobia. You may understand the nature of your problem and some of the sources of your problem, and you can have that special knowledge, but you're still afraid to go outside. And what you really need is to undergo a therapy, a process of therapy where you're no longer thinking about you know, how freaked out you are about going outside. <laughs> or how, you don't need the theory of uh, psychology uh, because uh, if you're a healthy person, if you're a genuine, you're just gonna go about your business uh, unselfconsciously. Uh, you know, um, so anyhow, th those are my two comments on caves and on knowledge. Thanks again. As always, great thoughts, my friend. So um, I, I agree with you totally uh, that Plato's use of the cave is very different than we find in the pre-Socratics. And we, in studying Greek philosophy, we would know why, right? Because Plato is trying to set himself off over against um, a good deal of the um, of the pre-Socratic pre tradition, just look at the essay on Parmenides, for example. And if you think about um, that essay, its subject, its, its portrayal of Parmenides and, and so forth, um, it completely deletes, completely erases Parmenides' role as, um, as a priest himself, uh, uh, for whatever experiences he was having in case. These, these, these uh, are really uh, not, not included, except that Plato wants to use the cave as a foil for all you see in the cave with shadows. You've got to you know, go out and see um, the good and, and truth. Uh, for your second comment, uh, I really want to latch on this idea of uh, of therapy, I, I suppose that 
my own reading of Taoism has uh, really changed in the last 10 years. And um, I have come to understand, think of it primarily as a sort of therapy. Uh, and I, I, not in a sense of technical sense of psychology. Uh, I think your caution there is really, really important. Uh, but it is meant to sort of help us overcome a kind of problem, and it may be a problem of our own making. These, I think Taoists Dal definitely think that we create our own, uh, our own problems. Uh, we're the ones that puzzle our lives. We're the ones that trouble our lives. You know, it's like the uh, person afraid to go outside is uh, troubling himself, as it were. And so they're uh, offering us a way that's not appealing to cognitive knowledge, lines of argument, and so forth, but something that you do. Uh, the practice itself is something you do, even if that practice is quietude and stillness. Um, you that is something you do, and this is meant, I think, to be the therapy itself. So, I didn't do a very good job on your on uh, your excellent comments, PJ. But thank you for sharing. Yeah. In interesting um, contrast with the um, uh, Platonic conception of cave and the Taoist or pre-Socratic conception. That, that's something really worth exploring. Um, uh, thank you, Philip, and, and thank you, Ronnie, for that. Um, uh, Helen? Hi, um, thank you so much. And thanks to the SOAS people for this absolutely fabulous series. Um, I'm a counseling philosopher. I have been doing philosophical counseling um, for about 20 years. I'm in, in Cape Town and I've always had kind of a Taoist flavor to it, although um, it's been reading on my own and I'm certainly not as, as skilled in, as the people who are talking here, but I'm so glad to hear you talking about therapy. And the question, I'm so looking forward to the to the recording because I can follow up on all of these things that you've brought with huge gifts. Um, but to add just some one other aspect is I'm wondering about the relational if there were relational practices if there were friendship practices between students other than and the teacher student role how how were these people relating with each other in these practices thanks. The whole time I was preparing this talk, uh, Helen, and I've been working with Hal Ross on, on this for several years, I've wondered this the same sort of thing because it looks like a very isolative form of practice where consider this, you're moving out of the world of community away from other people and you're getting progressively more isolated. You're moving into a cave. You're eventually moving into darkness and utter stillness. You're not interacting with your world um, in terms of sense perception. I mean, there's that passage from Zhuangzi where, you know, uh, Zhuangzi is talking uh, um, about um, sort of smashing, smashing his body, getting rid of the body feelings and the sense perceptions that the hearing, the touching, the tasting and so forth. And these seem to be moving you more and more toward a kind of isolation. But we do know that the, the master disciple lineages were strong and um, they're very well documented all the way back to the fourth century in, in the Zhuangzi. Um, Students are being sent by masters to other masters to study. Oh, I can't really, I've taken you as far as I can with that. I'm going to send you over here. And uh, there's the one whole chapter of Zhuangzi, the Nanrong, the Nanrong Chu chapter is all concerned 
with such an individual who's being moved around, Gun Sang Chu and so so forth. So I, I feel um, a little bit at a loss uh, responding to this uh, because, um, and I can be corrected, please correct me if I'm wrong, especially people like David and Chai and so forth, who really know the terrain very well here. But I, I just feel sometimes that uh, we don't have strong Taoist communities until about the second century CE. And if that's right, um, then you've got a period of about 400 years where you, where you have largely an individualistic kind of tradition or very small um, groups of master disciple lineages and small communities that might arise. That looks like it's um, triggering, triggering you to a thought, Helen. Please don't, don't be shy. Thank you, Helen. Um, Ryan? Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Littlejohn. Hey, Ryan. How are you? How are things at Harvard? Going very well. Thanks. I just passed my exam, so happy. Oh, um, congratulations. I was I was really struck. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, picking up on a number of things people have said about um, um, your point about Taoist practices therapeutic, um, and you kind of contrast that with soteriological. Um, Kind of continuing that strand, I'm really interested in the language of death that you were picking up on, um, particularly as it relates to kind of returning to to the state of infancy or something like that um, through contemplative practice. I'm wondering, though, um, you know, considering other elements of Taoist practice and and concerns, particularly with the kind of achievement or realization of immortality or longevity. Um, if we might see those uh, both at work, both therapeutic and soteriological, or maybe, you know, considering the diversity of the tradition, uh, if it just depends on who you're talking about and where, whether they are, uh, you know, maybe being more therapeutic or soteriological or both. Uh, but anyway, so the, the language of death in particular uh, struck me. I wonder if you could say more on that. Um, thank you very much. Great questions. Um, so when I, I'm saying that I, um, when I'm choosing therapeutic rather than soteriological uh, to describe Taoism, I guess by soteriological, I mean the dependence on something external uh, to, to save one, redeem one, to transform one, uh, whether that in, is in a kind of Abrahamic religious tradition tradition sense uh, um, or um, as opposed, let's say, to a, a, a Buddhist sense, a Buddhist philosophical sense or something. But I, I so the, I don't think there's an external transformation here. I don't, but you're quite right that it does depend on the context and community, doesn't it? Because certainly by the second century of the common era, maybe even before, we definitely see Taoist communities thinking of external transformation, of gods that do things for us and so forth. And um, I don't know exactly how that arises, how that shift arises. Um, maybe others among us do and, and could share. Um, but I, I think in these early practices and in the sense of contemplative practice, um, I think there's not an external like savior here. And so that's why I'm kind of trying to move aside the soteriological idea to the, to the therapeutic idea. Now on the matter of death, uh, I do think that even uh, even back into the Zhuangzi, the process of contemplative practice, the consciousness that gets sort of transformed there 
um, can verbalize the experience as, as dying to something in the past, something in the past is left. Um, now, by the time you get to, remember I had that like last poem about uh, from Wang Chong Yong. By the time you get to the 12th century, his speaking of himself as the living dead man. I mean, Wang actually created, actually dug a cave himself uh, and called it a grave. And, you know, the, the hagiographies of Wang uh, describe him as living a, li a life of debauchery and so forth. So in, in an almost traditional kind of redemptive story that he lived this wild life and had to be, uh, had to be reborn from it, had to be kind of saved from it. Not that the Tao saved him, but he does speak of, um, of dying to that life. And, uh, uh, but I think more in general, apart from someone like Wang, the story is that one dies to the constructions that one has made that are counter therapeutic, that tend to tie us in knots and such. Um, I don't know, Ryan, I feel maybe I didn't do that that well in responding, but I wonder if you have further thought, if any of that triggered thoughts for you. Uh, no, those are, those are great thoughts. Uh, one thing this randomly triggers is it just makes me think of the late Neo-Confucian Wang Yangming and his experience of kind of in, in his uh, coffin, you might say, of enlightenment kind of experience that kind of triggered his later thinking. But I don't think that's related. Maybe it is, but I don't think so. Well, we've got a couple of uh, experts on Wang Yangming with us this, uh, this afternoon, PJ and David Chai, you know, both know a great deal about Wang Yang Ming. You know, Wang has, um, those of you maybe who don't uh, know Wang Yang Ming, Wang has a notion, um, Liang Zhe, the notion of Liang Zhe, which is a kind of, uh, which is a kind of knowledge. And as I was working on this presentation, as I've been working on this presentation, this keeps coming up in my mind whether Wang was trying to find a way to talk about a sort of knowledge, uh, to talk about what the gain in the contemplative experience still in some sort of epistemological sense, still in some sort of uh, knowledge sense. But um, I, I just feel um, that it's the transformation and, and not a cognition that's gained in this experience. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Um, uh, we have Dennis. Hi, Ronnie. Good to see you. Hi, Dennis. Good to uh, see you. Uh, my question, or it's more of a thought, is actually exactly what you just finished with um, about knowledge. So I agree if we think of knowledge as something kind of propositional, uh, knowledge that, as people say. Uh, there is a problem with this kind of notion of mystical knowledge, and it also doesn't seem very Wu Wei if that's what's leading to, to action. Uh, but what if we think of knowledge as more as knowledge how in that kind of dichotomy, um, which I think works better with Wu Wei, which I've never understood. And yes, it's lack of self-consciousness or deliberateness, but it's not mindless. And if we think of Kodbing, for example, it does sometimes seem to entail some kind of expertise. So then the question is, uh, is there some kind of transformational experience that leads to knowledge how? And since Wang Yang Ming came up, I also was thinking about the unity of knowledge and action <laughs> in Wang Yang Ming. It's, it's a great point because Wang recognizes a long time before uh, I, I did in a way he's much more sophisticated than I, uh, he's recognizing this problem of the wills is still there because knowing how, knowing how to perform something or how to do something is still, you're, 
still have the problem of the will to do it. And so this is why with Leon Jir, with this notion, he's trying to put knowledge and action together. I think what he's doing is he's pointing to the problem more than solving the problem for us. I don't, uh, what do you think, Dennis? You... Well, I was thinking, so Wang Yangbing has an example that uh, recognize the odor as foul is to dislike. So it's not like a two-step process. First you yeah. smell it, then you dislike it. It's just all at once. So I think we definitely want that kind of unity um, that uh, whatever sitting in caves and doing these things does, it just, when it's finished, it manifests as just an ability to go into the world and act in a transformed way. So yeah, I mean, I think you're right to want to insist on that as not a two-step process. At first you have some kind of knowledge and then you go out and you, you practice it. Um, so therapy might also be a kind of an interesting way to think about it. And at least some models of therapy is you reach some realization and then well, your agoraphobia <laughs> disappears or your inability to navigate social occasions uh, disappears. Um, so I'm trying to think of a sort of mundane example of a transformative experience that leads to some kind of new skill. I think if I come up with one, I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ruth, please go ahead. Yes, not to take up all the time, but if I may comment on, on Ryan and Dennis and Ronnie, um, the three of them. Um, Ryan started with this question of death. What, what is it that dies? Um, the common credo is to die before you die. And, and what it is that dies, I think, is the person that we take ourselves to be. Because we come to realize that we are not that person that has consciousness, but that we are consciousness. And this is something completely different. I don't mean consciousness depending on the brain or being an aspect of the mind or being a mental phenomena, but to be consciousness, to be that capacity, to be conscious of other things. So what dies at that moment is the belief in being the human being, in the person. That person, is what creates all this trouble because that person grows old and will get ill and will die. And we have to make sure that he's not too cold and that he's fat and that he blood circulates and that he breathes. And you know, that, that person is the problem thing for us. Once we lose the identification with the person, we are free. We realize that we are consciousness. And that then coming back to Dennis is I think the only true knowledge, absolute knowledge we can have that is that I am consciousness. I can only speak for myself in the end, perhaps. So I'm taking the solipsistic point of saying I am consciousness and all else is object to me. So this, when I see that, when I realize that I'm consciousness, then I notice that this person is not so much doing, is not acting, but is being done. This, this person, the human being consists of genes, is conditioned in a certain way, finds itself in certain circumstances. And those things determine what this human being will do. It's not free to choose, it's, it's being done by whatever the whole thing that's going on. And that in, to realize that is that it's not a problem. This person is doing, is harmonious. It's either sitting here or it's not sitting here, but it can never be a conflict. The only conflict, the only problems we have are thinking problems. If we think that it should be different than it is, then we have a problem. When we realize that what is, is exactly what has to be, what ought to be, what is necessary, then we are free. So just a comment. Thank you, Ruth. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting comment. And, and Rooney, um, in connection to um, the conversation so far, uh, this, this, this idea of um, uh, contemplative practice and how it leads to um, consciousness, as it were, um, uh, or, or a perfected person, uh, whichever concept we, we, um, 
would want to uh, go with. Um, it seems it happens solitarily, you know. Um, um, it happens within the subject. And, and I was just thinking how much of Taoism uh, talks about um, intersubjective consciousness where, where, we de where we depend on others and have, um, and attain that uh, transformation or perfection through relationships. Um, how much of a relationality in terms of this, the subjective consciousness is uh, part of the, um, uh, yeah, it's part of the um, contemplative practice. Um, I'm asking as someone who is quite ignorant about uh, Taoism, but I, I would really have to, uh, I would really like to hear uh, your thoughts on that, particularly because uh, of the perspective I'm coming from, which is the African philosophical perspective, and a lot of emphasis on relationality and intersubjectivity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, any thoughts, Ronnie, uh, on that? You've got your finger right on the major difference between Confucianism and Taoism, right? Because um, in Confucianism, interrelationality is so important. We're created by each other and we create each other. And the um, five, five categories of relation or, or more. But um, certainly we, we don't only uh, need each other, but it's in that that our delight comes, our solving of the quandaries of existence uh, and, and of our life together come through the messiness of our life together. And um, whereas we, we've definitely been seeing in the discussion of contemplative practice today, we've been seeing a kind of move in another direction, more toward isolation. But now what I wonder is, is this not perhaps a natural outcome of what it means to practice contemplation? If when we contemplate, do we, con uh, when we practice mindfulness, can this be done together? Um, can we sort of cross cross consciousness as I suppose as Roots is continued to remind us uh, today? Um, and I'm not sure um, that that it can. It could be that the nature of the practice itself is isolating, moves towards isolation rather than toward community. Uh, I would love to hear others comment on that. Yeah, and, and, um, and something quite related to that, um, thinking of community now uh, more inclusively beyond human community, but to include yeah. um, non-human community, the environment, um, I mean, our very world in which we find ourselves. Um, it, it seems that, um, um, while there's not a lot of connection with the other human, <coughs> there seems to be a lot of connection with the other non-human, um, with caves, with mountains, with, with wind, with air. Um, and, and I was just thinking in terms of, of course, our contemporary experiences and climate change, climate crisis, and um, how much of um, a theoretical framework from Taoism can help repair relationships with the environment. Yeah, what I'm intrigued uh, by there, uh, Elvis, is your mention of um, non-human uh, animals and so forth, because uh, I think looking at how animals are portrayed, um, how they're talked about, how they're engaged with in Taoism is very interesting. And um, in a way, if you, if you take the view in Taoism, you know, like behold the animal or look at the animal, they're really kind of seen as um, the animal doesn't have the clutter of the mind that we do. The animal's mind is more simple. 
So the animal is living with the puzzle, the paradigm, the pro doesn't problematize its existence uh, as it is. So it's almost moving more towards Ziran, as Ryan was talking about, or maybe even Wu Wei. Do animals Wu Wei? Uh, I, I mean, I think you could make an argument for an affirmative answer on that in terms of Taoism. Um, but so, you know, you, you, you see this is very, very much in contrast, I suppose, to... So if you think of, of the way um, I was just teaching this a few weeks ago, Nietzsche begins the, that little work uh, on the advantages and disadvantages of history. Uh, Nietzsche begins the work talking about, consider the cow, consider the cattle, look out on this field, you know, and you're looking at the cow or the cattle. And, um, but Nietzsche doesn't idealize them. He doesn't look to move toward that kind of simplicity, you know, cows, cattle, non-human animals, they have no notion of history. They, you know, they don't employ their reason and so forth. So, um, his view is very, very different. He doesn't see, or maybe doesn't feel that kind of mm, simplicity that you would see, um, that, that a Taoist would, would see. So uh, that was, that's just a few random thoughts about human, non-human world. Uh, elders may have much better thoughts than mine. Yeah, I mean, it's very good. I mean, it's um, something worth exploring, definitely. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, I think we've had very um, interesting conversations in the last um, roughly 50 minutes um, based on a 40 minutes lecture, and I'm sure it would, it would go on and on and on if, if we wanted to. Um, there is a lot of um, interest you have um, sort of raised um, with, with your lecture, Ronnie, and um, uh, many of us will be looking at quite looking at the lecture again. Um, and uh, for, for all those who um, uh, registered for the lecture, we'll, we'll send the YouTube link uh, once it's ready in the next few days. So you can um, um, view it again and be able to reflect a bit more, contemplate a bit more, um, as contemplation is never rushed, per se. Um, so um, it, uh, any last questions or comments uh, before we draw the curtain? Anyone? May I just say, Elvis, I would like to express my appreciation to everyone who came today for your interest. Um, please send suggestions, improvements. Uh, I, wel I welcome them. And thank you for those of you who asked questions. Thank you for your questions. They were insightful and very stimulating. So appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Ronnie. We are very pleased um, to to have had you today, and um, to to um, we've enjoyed the lecture definitely. We've enjoyed all the questions and comments, and it's been an opportunity to also um, meet uh, uh, new colleagues uh, who I'm sure I'll be writing to and uh, asking more questions uh, based on their questions and comments as well. Um, so thank you all for um, coming, for enjoying uh, the eighth lecture uh, with us. Uh, we're looking forward to the ninth lecture in June, um, and hopefully we'll be having a talk on Arabic philosophy or so, um, and the next one in, in, in uh, August. Um, so we'll keep looking at um, some philosophical traditions of the world. There are very many. and. Um, uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us again. So um, thank you all for coming and do enjoy a lovely weekend. Thank you.